Thank you for tuning in on today. I'm so excited that you're here once again. God has blessed us immensely uh, to come to worship him in truth, spirit and in truth. And we're grateful that God has given you this moment to be a part of this experience. We are in the last Sunday of the year of 2020, and we're excited that God has gotten us to this point and sustained us. But also let me announce to you on today, on New Year's Eve night, that is December the 31st at 7 p.m., I want to encourage you to tune in with us as we share a word for us as we prepare ourselves to transition into the year 2021. And that is uh, December the 31st at 7 p.m. I want to encourage you to, to tune into the same location, the same station, um, the same uh, place where you can hear the word of God. We do want to encourage you to do that. Invite your family, invite your friends. That's on December the 31st, New Year's Eve celebration at 7 p.m. But on today, today is the last Sunday of the year, and we're excited that you're here once again. So go with me for a moment of prayer and supplication. God, our Father, we're so thankful for this day. Master, most of all, I thank you for your darling son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the privilege and the honor and the opportunity to come before you with thanksgiving, to come before you with our thoughts and our concerns and our challenges. But most of all, God, to give us the guiding light that we need to go through the scripture and this word of God to be a blessing to those who are viewing online. We're praying for their safety. We're praying for their health. We're praying, oh God, that you will give us preaching clarity and conciseness and allow us to be true to the word of God. And we're praying, oh God, that you will help us as we move forward in the word in such a way that we'll bring help and hope for those who are listening online. It's in your daughter and son, Jesus Christ, saying we do pray. Amen. Once again, I'm excited that you're here, that God has blessed us to be a part of this experience on today, God has continued to truly bless us over and over again. So I want to look at the second part of this message, the game changer, part two. The game changer, part two. Look at Isaiah chapter nine, Isaiah chapter nine and verse number six. Scripture reads as follows. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the game changer, part two. New ideas for innovative products and businesses are formed every day, yet few successfully disrupt their respective fields. The execution of that idea can be as important as the idea itself, and the people who drive the execution are, in fact, often termed as the critical success factor, or in our term on today, they are the game changers. They are the game changers that uh, brings innovation in the life of business and economics and education as well as science. Here, as we listen uh, to some of these game changers that may uh, bring something to your mind and thought process, it is Richard Branson, founder of the Virgin Group, changed multiple facets of our lives by building an incredible conglomerate from a simple record label. It was Ursula Burns, uh, who is the CEO of Xerox, changed the world's view on who can be a CEO when she became the first African-American woman to head a Fortune 500 company. It is Jonathan Ive, who is the senior vice president of design at Apple, changed the look and feel of our mobile phones, computers, tablets, and music players. The world knows them as the game changers. But I want to suggest to you, brothers and sisters, that there is a game changer that supersedes and exceeds these individuals, even though they are talented, even though they are skilled in their respected fields. There is one that covers the entire landscape of life. It is Jesus, who is the great game changer or the ultimate game changer. That's the person I want to introduce to you and reintroduce some of you because you may have not maximized the many wonderful benefits that's within your personal benefit package if you know him as your savior and Lord. The game changer, part two. Jesus is the ultimate game changer. He prevents us from sinking in the midst of suppression. He's the one that helps us uh, to move beyond being commandeered by complacency. Jesus is that great changer, a uh, game changer who can shift and change the very course 
and the length and the breadth of our lives, if we can only adhere to him, if we can only acquiesce, if we can only assimilate uh, to the affinity of God and understand that Jesus Christ is the ultimate game changer. So if you are sinking in the midst of suppression, if you've been commandeered by complacency, if you have been baffled by burdens, if you have been perplexed by your problems, then I want to introduce to you somebody that can move you from the mode of mediocrity and meandering in a place of misery. And that is Jesus Christ, who is that ultimate game changer. Do you need a game change? And do you need something to shift, something to change, something to happen significant in your life so that you can experience the blessings of God, the abundance of God, and the prosperity of God? So let me introduce you to, or reintroduce you to the game changer. Here we are in the midst of our text, brothers and sisters. It is that place in space where there is gloom and doom. In the midst of this era, it's the midst of a darkness and despair and discouragement, and the people of Judah need a game change. It is the prophet that cannot do it. It is not, it is not the minor prophets nor the major prophets that can do it, but it is Jesus the Christ who is the ultimate prophetic move of God that will help to shift and change them in the midst of their doom and despair move them from being uh, uh, scattered by the shattering of their situation and it's Jesus who becomes the ultimate game changer. Here it is, brothers and sisters. It's at this time that Isaiah spoke, the leaders and the people of Judah were waiting on the armies of Israel and Syria, as I said on last week, because they were under attack and as they heard the danger from the Assyrians, they would be tempted to put their focus on them, but the focus was on these armies and not on the Lord. But Isaiah, that great prophet, says battle against Syria and Israel by setting your focus on the Lord because ultimately Jesus uh, is the weapon that can change and shift the direction of your lives. Jesus is the one that is the ultimate game changer for the people of Judah in the midst of being crushed by their enemies, in the midst of being overwhelmed by their circumstance, in the midst of going through the problems of life. But yet Jesus is that ultimate game changer. Listen, brothers and sisters, very clear, clearly, as we look at the text, as Texas Taylor teaches, I want to focus on uh, the very significant attributes of God. On last week, we focused on him being a wonderful counselor, and he is. He's a mighty God, and he is. But on today, let's take a close look. Pull your seats in close and listen to the word of God as God unveils what he is as it relates to being the everlasting father and the prince of peace. Listen, if you will. Jesus, the Christ, through Isaiah, is offering us a gift. This Messiah that has mastered the moments of our lives to help us to get to the next level. He offers a gift that a gift that does not tarnish, that is not tainted, nor is it torn. But it's a gift that brings triumph in the midst of tribulation and trouble. It is the gift that has become the game changer for your life. So the first part, as we unwrap this package, as we unwrap this uh, this box and remove the bowl, if you will. And inside this is a precious, precious contents and precious cargo because it is Jesus the Christ that's being offered to you at this moment as an ultimate game changer. Listen, he's an ultimate game changer because he offers us an everlasting father. So now notice here, it, the text says he's an everlasting father. He's a father, literally the, 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 the term should be termed this way. He's a father of eternal. He's a father for all ages. He is not restricted by time. He's not restricted by age, nor is he restricted by death. He is the God that continues without hesitation and without reservation. He is the everlasting father. So what does it look like in our lives to have the everlasting father before us and for us to experience him? Number one, he's a father that engages in uninterrupted presence. The fact that he is the everlasting father suggests to us 
that he has an uninterrupted presence. Isn't that good news? No matter what you're going through, what you're experiencing in life, whether you have been jolted on your job, whether you have been ridiculed in a relationship, you have an everlasting father whose presence is uninterrupted. You know that he will hang out with you in the midst of your heartaches. You know that he'll stand up with you in the midst of in those shattering moments. His presence is uninterrupted. You don't have to worry about friends shifting him. You don't have to worry about family shifting him, but his presence is uninterrupted. Listen here, if you will. There are some proof texts that suggest that his presence is uninterrupted. Listen to Moses as he clarifies it when he says it's in Exodus chapter 33. He says, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. He says, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. And you got to understand that during this particular time period, the children of God are in the midst of a wilderness in the midst of a dark moment, in the midst of a, a perilous moment, in the midst of a risky moment. But God the Father, he's not just anybody, but he's the father of eternal. He's the father of all ages. He is not restricted by age, nor death, nor situation. He's the everlasting father. And he says, my presence shall go with you. Through the flood, through the rain, through the fire, he said, I will go with you. He says, I won't duck out. I won't move myself from it. I won't slip away. I won't tip out, but I will stick and stay. He's an everlasting father because of his uninterrupted presence. Listen to what the psalmist says. He says, you will make known to me the path of life and in your presence is the fullness of joy in your presence. Is the fullness of joy. No wonder Nehemiah says that the, that the joy of the Lord is my strength. No wonder the apostle Paul epitomizes the word joy in the presence of God in the book of Philippians because he understood as long as God's presence was available, no matter what pushed against him, no matter what tried to parlay him, that Jesus the Christ Presence was always available, even if you're being jolted on your job, even though you're being ravaged by a relationship. You know that there is somebody that will stick and stay with you through thick and thin. The father that engages in an uninterrupted presence, a father that engages in uninterrupted protection. Listen to what Isaiah says. He says, no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment shall be condemned. This is the heritage. Notice this. This is your heritage. This is what that comes from the last will and testament to give to the people of God. This is your inheritance. And there is righteousness from me or vengeance from me. He says, no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. That's what life is like. When you have an everlasting father, you don't have to fight. You don't have to fuss. You don't have to cuss because God serves as your protection. God is your protection when you don't even know that you're being protected. God is your protection even when others are trying to come against you and your foes are trying to rob you and trying to destroy you and disrupt your life. He, they don't even realize that God has a shield around you. Why do you think that when Job was in the midst of minding his own business, doing his own thing, and the ultimate enemy tried to come and disrupt and devour and destroy Job. But, but God says you can take away everything. He says, but I will place a hedge of protection around him. <laughs> Listen, he's an everlasting father because of his uninterrupted presence. He's an everlasting father because of his uninterrupted protection. But he's an everlasting father because the father engages in uninterrupted Provision. Listen, what? Listen, as we think about the story of of a major prophet uh, and Elijah in the book of Kings, chapter 17, it talks about uh, what God can do with an empty barrel. You remember that story in which the, the widow woman comes with a few sticks and a, a little oil in a jug and a flower, uh, flour in a jar. And she comes before the prophet and the prophet tells her, don't be afraid, go home and do as you have said. But first, make me a small cake. 
But notice what happened as she goes through the midst of that. Now we see God's work done in God's way and we'll never let God supply. And immediately she did exactly what the prophet said, which is representative of who God is and the everlasting father and his provision. And as a result of that, she did exactly what God told her to do. For the jar of flour was not used up. The jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. God shall supply all your need according to the riches of glory. He says, Paul says, I have learned therewith to be content to be high and to be low because I know that God is going to supply all of my needs according to my riches and glory. Well, if the children of Israel was here today, they would tell you as they were wandering and meandering throughout the wilderness, it was God that was able to rain down manna from heaven and feed them. And the Bible says that their feet did not wax over or wax uh, wax uh, in a place where it is torn or disrupted, but they will not worn out. But God sustained them because of his provision. He's an everlasting father because of his uninterrupted presence, because of his uninterrupted protection, because of his uninterrupted provision. God will supply all of your needs. Isn't it good, good news to know that he's your father? He's, he's much more than a father. He's intimate. He has built a relationship. He's concerned about you. He's in love with you. He's compassionate about you. He has a desire to be there with you. He, he's able to stick through the thick and thin when others have walked out on you. He's an everlasting father. Listen, there was a CEO of a major nonprofit that stated that his kids can always get through to him in the business of times. They can still get through to him because he is their father. The CEO told his, sir, his assistant that whenever his family calls to always put them through, he stated that he may not be able to talk to them long each time, but he would at least have a conversation. But he wants them to know that thousands of clients or employees don't get in the way of him being their father. The good news, brothers and sisters, just because God is God of the universe, that doesn't mean that he is getting in the way of him being your father. Even though he's got millions and millions and millions and millions of children of God that he must govern, he's still your daddy. And as our father, God makes himself available to us. Why do you think that Paul says that he let your moderation be known unto God because the Lord is at hand. He's an everlasting father. The game changer happens because he's an everlasting father. The game changer continues because he offers us the Prince of Peace. You go back to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and you see the latter part. He says, in, in chapter 6, he says again, he says he offers us an everlasting father. The next part in text says, and now he offers us the Prince of Peace. Brothers and sisters, a Prince of Peace. What does the Prince of Peace have to offer to you? What is the benefit of having the Prince of Peace in your life? How advantageous is it to have the Prince of Peace when your life may be riddled with conflict? How, how advantageous is it to have the Prince of Peace in your life when life seems to have its moments of chaos? How advantageous is it to have the Prince of Peace in your life when it helps you to be able to go to bed and go to sleep at night because you know that the Prince of Peace is available and he is accessible and he allows us to benefit from the peace that he has to offer unto us. He offers us <laughs> the Prince of Peace. So the Prince of Peace prepares us with a new status. Notice if you will, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, John, the 14th chapter, verse 27, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, uh, do I give to you, uh, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Isaiah chapter 53, 5 says, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 says, we are justified by faith and now we have the peace of God. 
Why, why, watch this. So in other words, he has broken down the barriers. We're no longer living behind the enemy lines of darkness and despair, discouragement and depression. But we have been, been rescued. We have been snatched from the jaws of death. And God has brought us across the enemy lines. Whereas before we had no hope, we had no help, there was no possibilities and there was no probability. But because Christ God broke down the walls, now there exists a peace treaty between you and God. No longer are you an enemy of God. You're now a child of God. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. He brings life and brings more abundantly into you. He supplies your needs according to the riches and glory. You have all the advantageous uh, benefits of knowing God. You have a benefit package according to Ephesians chapter number one. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And as a result of that, now you are in harmony with God. Now you are in sync with God. Now you are in a good place with God. The Prince of Peace prepares us with a new status because of what he has given, because of what he has granted, and because he has rescued you from the clutches of the enemy. You're no longer living behind enemy lines, and now God has created a spiritual army. And brothers, there's something about having the peace of God in your life. It makes all the difference. In the world. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, the Prince of Peace prepares us with a new status because of what he's given, because of what he's granted, and because he's been willing to grab us, glean us, and gather us from the clutches of Satan. We have a new status, and that peace gives us that new status. But not only the Prince of Peace prepares us with a new status, but the Prince of Peace prepares us with a necessary stabilization. Listen, if you will. The Bible says in Isaiah 26 and 3, it says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. Now we've got the peace of God with the new status. But now we got peace with God because we have now a necessary stabilization. He will keep your mind. He will keep your heart. He will keep you stabilized and focused and balanced. <laughs> stable. Not unstable. Poise. Not erratic. Cool. Not over the top, calm, not beyond the moment of stabilization, but calm, pause in a moment of tranquility when all of life is falling apart. That's what Paul says. Paul says it's the peace with God. And the peace of God shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Literally, he says, I will, 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 will send a 24 hour, 20, 24 hour, seven days a week guard. And I will keep your mind stable. I will keep you tranquil. I will keep you calm. I will keep you poised. I will keep you balanced while all of the world is going to hell in the handbasket and all of the chaos is going on around you. God says, I am the peace. <laughs> the Prince of Peace prepares us with necessary stabilization. Can you imagine while everybody else is tripping, while everybody else is pulling their hair out, while everybody else is falling apart at the scene, people are wondering Pondering, how is it that you still remain at peace? Because I've got the peace of God and I've got peace with God. 
I've got a new status and I've got necessary stabilization. But notice here, the Prince of Peace offers me a new status, necessary stabilization, but the Prince of Peace prepares us with a non-negotiable standard. Now that I have peace with God, I have the peace of God, then I'm able to extend that peace. God brought peace between God and humanity. God brought peace between the Jews and the Gentiles. And then he says to us that if you're going to be a child of God, then you have to be a peacemaker and peaceable and a desire to see the gospel of peace being proclaimed in the lives of others. Listen to what Matthew says. He says that blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. One translation says children of God. When you got peace with God and you got the peace of God, you have no desire bringing, uh, sowing uh, seeds of discord or deceit and evilness. But when you have the peace of God and the peace with God, you are the desiring to be a peacemaker, not a peace breaker. But listen to what the gospel says. He says, in order for you to be a citizen of the kingdom, because Matthew chapter 5 deals with the Sermon on the Mount. He says, in order for you to be a citizen of the kingdom, then you have to be a peacemaker. He says, that's one of the blessed eight states. He says, you are a peacemaker. And the results and the rewards of being a peacemaker, we are recognized and we are identified as children of the king. Paul says it even better in Galatians. He says, he says, he talks about the fruit of the spirit. He says, these are the characteristics. This is the makeup. This is the nature. This is the essence of the child of God. Love, joy, and peace. Question hour. Are you a peacemaker or are you a peace breaker? And if you're a peace breaker, there's a possibility you have no relationship with God. But if you specialize in being a peace maker, that does not mean that you're walked on. Sometimes it's a thankless job. Sometimes people don't understand and reap the benefits and understand the rewards until later on down the line. But the fact of the matter is your desire is you are to be, as Paul says in the book of Corinthians, to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation. Blessed are the peacemaker. Are you a peacemaker in your family? Or are you the one that's noted to bring chaos, confusion, conflict and fights and quarreling. But are you a peacemaker by your actions, by your attitude, and by your activities? Activities. He says, the Prince of Peace prepares us with a non-negotiable standard, and that standard is to be a peacemaker. Listen to what the proverb writer says. He says it even better. He says, the seat, verse 12, Proverbs chapter 12, uh, verse number 20. He says, the seat is in the heart of those who devise evil, but those who plan peace have joy. And so, brothers and sisters, understand this. So once you understand that you are, you have the you have the characteristics of your life should be peace being peaceful and have peace in your heart. But as a result of that, you can experience the joy and the happiness and the very, the very, the beauty of life. When you are a peacemaker, the question now is, God wants to be your game changer and offer you the everlasting father and offer you the Prince of Peace. Listen, two painters were in a contest 
where each said that they could paint a picture of peace. One painter painted this sunset with the sun going down over the calm water. It looked, looked all nice, looked very nice, and the picture had a very calming effect. The other painter painted a picture of a storm. And in it, the sky was dark and there was lightning, there was thunder, there was dark clouds rolling overhead. The picture showed the waves crashing against the rocks. Things looked very, fairly chaotic. But in the corner of the painting, at the bottom were two big stones with a bird in the middle of them. The bird was singing, now vast peace. Peace is where God's calm and God's tranquility, tranquility overrules your concerns. So the question of the hour is, are you at peace with your life, with your goals, with your dreams, with the direction of your life? Then if you're not, gravitate to this everlasting father. Assimilate with the Prince of Peace. He'll make a difference in your life. The game changer. Do you need a change in your life? Turn to Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. Read it over and over and over again until it becomes part and parcel of your life and you can project it Proclaim it and possess it. Because God wants to change your life. So if you're here today, you don't know Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sin, you've never accepted him as your personal savior. On that screen is a digital form. I want to encourage you to complete that form, fill it out, share with us so that we know who you are and that you're walking in the newness of God and the newness with Christ and you have been introduced to him. And you want, so you want us to know about it and you want us to share with you and to help you to walk forward in this Christian growth uh, because that's what this is about, Christian growth, Christian maturity. Uh, moving from just being a mere church member to really being a child of the king and knowing the scripture for yourself to bring application and not only just information. So I want to encourage you to fill out and complete that form on today. So I want us to go with us for a moment of prayer and supplication and intercession. So if you're unsaved, I want you to pray with me. If you need to reconnect with Christ, I want you to pray with me as well. Let us pray. God, our Father, I'm so thankful for this day that you've given us an opportunity to come before you. I want to pray on behalf of this person, God, that may be struggling, that may be unsaved, that may have not uh, had a change in his or her life, that needs you to be the center of their lives, that needs you to be the king and the Lord of their life. We're praying right now, God, that you will forgive them of their sins cleanse the slate, consecrate their lives. They admit, they believe, and confess that you are the Lord and Savior, praying, oh God, that you will come into their life right now. Change them, move them, and move them in a new direction. Perhaps, God, that person is not the person that's praying, but there's another person that may be viewing or listening that may have uh, connected with you at one point in time, but they have disconnected uh, because of some things that may have occurred in their life or some things that they've been exposed to. But at this time, God, they've heard your voice and they want to reconnect. They want to rededicate. They want to restart and reinitiate their lives in such a way uh, that they can live life afresh and anew with you. So God, I'm praying for that person. He or she wants to rededicate their life, renew their life, restore their life, and get into a better place with you and a walk with you. Praying, oh God, that you will come into their life right now and help them to see life through a new set of lenses. God, this is your servant's prayer. It's in your daughter's son, Jesus Christ's name. We do pray. Now, if you prayed either one of those prayers, the prayer of salvation or the prayer of rededication, we want you to complete that form, please, ma'am, and sir. And so that you have an opportunity uh, to live life afresh, live Christ a life of new. So we give you that opportunity to do that. Please, ma'am and sir, we look forward to you doing that. And we know that God is going to tremendously bless your life if you will do that. So we encourage you to complete that form and submit that to us so that we can walk together in this Christian life. So I want to encourage you to remember what we said at the beginning of the broadcast of the, uh, uh, the, the preaching moment is this, that New Year's Eve uh, is on December the 31st. I want to encourage you to tune in with us 
at 7 o'clock p.m. where we will share a message that will help us to transition into the year 2021. I want to encourage you to be there. Please, ma'am and sir, invite your friends, invite your family, and all of those that you can to be a part of this experience at 7 o'clock p.m., December the 31st at 7 p.m. I want to encourage you to be there. That is New Year's Eve's service. Now, I do also want to encourage you, remember that we'll be back again on the first Sunday, which is January the 3rd, um, 2021. It is amazing that God is getting us to that point, but that will be another opportunity where we can worship together and celebrate together. We will have our Lord's Supper. So we want to encourage you, if you're not a part of a local church and you want to participate and you have been saved, you know Christ for yourself, and you want to participate in this moment of the Lord's Supper, I want to encourage you to get some grape juice, uh, wafer or cracker so that you can participate symbolically with us um, in a moment where we can commemorate the death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Now, remember again, December the 31st at 7 p.m. is New Year's Eve service. Um, and January the 3rd will be the first Sunday of the new year, 2021, where we commemorate uh, the, the, the Lord's death, burial, and the resurrection, our Lord's Supper, or Holy Communion, as some of you may know it. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. We love you being a part of our experience. Let us know. Give us a shout out. Let us know that you are hearing us and that you're listening to the word and it's changing your life. So I want to encourage you to always remember the following words, walk with the king and be blessed.